Hello and welcome to yet another video on real analysis. My name is Seanak and welcome to my channel Physics for Students. First of all, I would like to thank all the subscribers who have seen this video, my earlier two videos on real analysis. The type of comments and encouragement which I have received from all of you really has motivated me to continue with real analysis and further make those videos. I'm really very really thankful for all those who have sent me WhatsApp messages, put up comments and have encouraged me to continue with real analysis. Before we go ahead and uh, continue with this video, a small correction. Yes, I made a small error in the last video and I'm thankful to this person, Somis Nafis Sadiq, who really corrected me in uh, making uh, in correcting this error yeah although the error was not deliberate what I showed in the last video was that there was a problem with conjecture and axiom right and you see that he has been so uh, minutely observing the video and have mentioned that axiom and conjecture have same properties no they don't have the same properties I made a mistake and I apologize for that so first of all a big note of thanks to Somis Somik because he's the person who watched the video so minutely and uh, he corrected with me. So my kind apologies to all the viewers for making this uh, uh, error, although the error was not intentional, but this gives you motivation that how minutely and in details all of you are watching and listening my video. So in order to go ahead with the correction, here is what. So a conjecture is basically an unproven, but remember it is not unprovable statement that is also generally accepted to be true right a statement that we believe to be true so the Poincare conjecture and there are examples of Goldbach conjecture however axiom statements that are assumed to be true most of which can be proved to be true by reasoning so you can say that a basic assumption about a mathematical situation and Euclid's axioms all those things are there so this is a kind of a small mistake which I have done and uh, thank you for Somik for pointing out and here is the correct one the actual difference or the understanding which is what is a conjecture which is unproved an axiom that is a basic assumption about a mathematical situation okay so here we go ahead and let us just quickly uh, you know uh, come uh, and wrap up what we have learned because those who are watching this video for the first time have not watched the video I don't really want you to miss on those important topics so first is that what is real analysis which we have discussed in the earlier video that it is actually the mother of calculus and it goes ahead beyond extending calculus proving the certain uh, formulas which we assume to be true but uh, there are no false assumptions or just mere assumptions we go ahead and understand and prove them and extend the formulas of calculus to further dimensions we also learned that is real analysis necessary to study yes it is necessary to study because that gives you a problem solving ability and to appreciate the real beauty of calculus in a much more better way and understand the real beauty of mathematics behind the calculus we also learned that whether real analysis is a difficult subject because this is a very common thing with most of the students question. We are unable to understand the uh, classes of mathematics, what the professor is talking about. No, it is not at all uh, difficult. It is something which is, uh, I would say, a little bit abstract, a little bit uh, disturbing at the initial phase, but it is absolutely not a real difficult subject. We and from my side, this entire episode's effort is to clear up the concepts of real analysis, go deep and make yourself happy and you really enjoy the subject. We also learn what are the prerequisites of study. So I have talked in my previous video that it is not only linear algebra, partial differential equations and calculus, but it is more of a proof based, based rigorous mathematical model. So what you need is one, 
a complete understanding of a proof based system second what you need need is a sandwich method and third most importantly is persistence slowly the gate my brain gets wired into those abstract thoughts and understanding so these are the prerequisites of study those who have missed the earlier video on which these topics we have discussed it is there in my playlist in real analysis the first and the second lecture you can watch it out and we also talked about the practical applications of real analysis uh, which is primarily based on digital imaging what i discussed about wavelet and certain part of economics those who are studying advanced economics and phd the real analysis part the convergence and uh, divergence these things really play an important role so this is all in all what we have learned earlier those who have missed i would request them we, these are motivational and important topics to give a solid understanding go ahead and see into my video and uh, so that you don't miss on any of one of these topics okay so we are all motivated to go nothing to worry about and we are taking a step by step approach in order to understand this subject okay so before we go ahead i just want to show you a basic structure so that uh, the uh, the you you can understand things see knowledge is just like a pyramid so the base is much wider and as we go up right at the top it becomes smaller and smaller until it converges to a point so what i mean to say is that right at the base we have to make the base strong otherwise the pyramid will topple down so real number system of axioms natural numbers induction this comes at the base then we go ahead with continuity limits in finite limits and theorem further we extend to basic properties of functions on r1 and then we get elementary theory of differentiation where all these chain rules which we use as formulas are now being proved right and we extend that chain rule into several other theorems and how we can extend to n dimension and further and further so the basic idea of showing this model is that until we get the base strong we won't be able to reach the top so the base takes a little bit of time why because the base is wide so yes this is the first thing that we are going to do we are going to deal with axioms and natural numbers so that we can make the base strong so if i go ahead with real analysis as a subject right what are the things that comes into our mind first is that it is a proof based mathematical system so uh, the students or the freshmen who are first encountering an real analysis might find it difficult why because we have not encountered a real rigorous proof based system before prior to this we are given formulas we are plugging those formulas and we are getting the results but where these formulas come from this is what real analysis deals about so first we get a proof based system then obviously it is logical because certain proofs are based on logic so uh, uh, it is better that you get aware about those uh, quantifiers logical quantifiers set theories etc it is little bit abstract for the reason that uh, we really cannot show you uh, immediately that this leads to this so if you add or you multiply or do continuity or limit it would result into uh, um, uh, something which can be quantified right so this is a little bit abstract but don't worry these abstract things slowly leads to the real part it is rigorous yes because everything in the proof needs to be proved everything in real analysis which we assume to be formulas these are not formulas this needs to be proved and it is theoretical as i told that abstract and theoretical because we really cannot show you what things immediately would result to so these are the five important things which are important for real analysis for you to understand so that when you step forward these things are already wired in your mind okay so we go ahead and first understand what is a field and a field axiom now before i go ahead i want to show you very abstract kind of a figure or at rather a picture uh, whenever we close our uh, um, uh, close our eyes and think of a field what comes to our mind is immediately this right a wide expanded area with grass all around trees and people playing and people resting over here so this is what is a field is all about so what we call a field is a set of rules right a field in mathematics is any object that follows the rules so here we say that field is a set of rules i'm coming to those parts which might seem a little bit abstract right now 
So we can think of uh, the axioms as a list of properties, any object wi uh, with those properties is a field. So let me explain you. For example, I take this bottom area which is marked in red. It is a kind of a green grass or a sapling or whatever you want to tell. And this has got certain properties. Right. And we call this property as addition. Okay. Then we take a further grass. Right. And then we go ahead and we uh, do it as multiplication. Then we take another grass or maybe a sapling and we define this property as subtraction. And then we take another one and we define it as division. Okay. So what I am doing is that these properties can only really be given in the technical terms, but they describe the basics of how arithmetic works. Right. The entire arithmetic is based on this. So this is how we divide. So what I can tell you that the field axiom is something you have to set of things which you can add, subtract, multiply and divide. And in a sense, you can say it looks right when you do. So these properties, associativity, commutivity and distributivity and associativity are basically these set of rules or set of properties which are set on the field. Right. So, uh, in other words, they basically mean that in some but not all ways, your things work like numbers. Okay. So, examples include real numbers, rational numbers, complex numbers. So, let us take two rational numbers. We add, subtract, multiply, divide them and we will get another rational number. And these rational numbers obey the usual rules, which is right there in front of your screen, associativity, commutivity and so on. Now, here is a small note to all the uh, viewers that although these properties, associativity and commutivity, we have seen our school or maybe college days, we are still doing that in uh, uh, advanced uh, mathematical subject called real analysis. Why we are doing this? Because I will explain to you, these are not only the uh, set of properties or rules, we are going deep into that, we are going to understand. So I hope this analogy makes you clear that what is a field, let us imagine it to be a wild area, wide area and those grass and saplings are different operations, uh, different rules and the field set a rule, a rule of the games and the properties also. Okay, so what is a field? Let us see what it defines. A field is any set of elements that satisfies the field axioms, right? So you can just do the operation. Any collection of objects satisfying the axioms is what is called a field. And we called field axiom as something like that. A field is any set of elements that satisfies the field axiom for both addition and multiplication. And these are the properties, which is you have already read in the earlier part. So this is some. So this gives you an idea what is a field and what is a field axiom. Okay, so we move ahead and understand that what are field properties. Now, what I am trying to tell you that a real number system, which we sometimes called just a reals, is first of all a set. So I have defined A, B, C, D and so on, on which the operations of addition and multiplication are defined so that every pair of real number has unique sum and product, both real numbers with the following properties. So that I have just written. And what are those properties? These are the properties. Right. So what I'm trying to tell you is that any collection of objects satisfying the axioms, okay, any collection of objects satisfying the axioms given below is called the field. I mean to say the axioms. In particular, the system of real numbers satisfied the axioms and we indicate how the customary laws of elementary algebra concerning addition, subtraction and multiplication and division are direct consequences of the axiom for a field. So here is something very important. So a uh, system of real numbers satisfying this axiom and we define how the laws of general elementary simple algebra, uh, the operations of addition, etc. are direct consequences of the axioms for a field. So these are the direct consequences of the axioms for a field. Field we have already defined and the field, it is actually the field properties are real numbers on which these operations are defined. So this gives you a kind of a clarity on field properties. Okay. Now once we talk about field properties, etc., the immediate thing that comes to our mind is that we need to go ahead and see certain axioms. Now we all know what is an axiom. We have seen Euclid's axioms, many axioms, but the question is that in real analysis, why do we need axioms? Okay. 
So first of all, we need to understand that axioms give context to mathematical questions. Now, wh what I mean by this is, for example, 1 plus 1 could equal 0 or 1 or 2 depending on the context. So one hungry cat plus one plump mouse equals no more mouse. Uh, one jug of water plus one jug of water equals one jug of water. If the third jug was a volume, has a volume equal to the sum of the volumes of the first two jugs. So one plus one equals two if we are talking about real numbers. So without axioms in mathematics, we won't be able to share the same basic assumptions about things like number, geometry, etc. So here is something very interesting. Axioms have been invented only in order to consolidate and formalize the knowledge of abs abstracted from the observation of reality. It is, it has been interesting in order to formalize, to get a proper kind of a formal system. So even if our assumptions about supposedly simple things such as, for example, a straight line have a profound effects on the resulting mathematics, Euclid wrote about straight lines and the assumption was made that everyone knew that he was talking about. So the most important thing is that without axioms, why we need axiom that we would not be able to share the same basic assumptions to other people. Yes, in mathematics, we need axiom and that is what mathematics is all about, axioms and deductions. So now there is something which is called the axiomatization. Now axiomatization is a formal method for specifying the content of a theory wherein a set of axioms is given from which the remaining content of the theory can be deduced deductively as theorems. So the, the, the biggest example of axiomatization is uh, Bertrand Russell's Principia Mathematica which tried to reduce all these uh, arithmetical laws into simple logic which was later disproved by Kurt Gödel through his incompleteness theorem. So axiomatization is basically a formalization or a content of a set of axioms through which the theory can be dedu deduced. So this is what I just wanted to tell you that why do we need the axioms because we will be dealing with axioms only, right? So first we come to what is called axioms of addition. Now this, this video will primarily concern about axioms of addition and multiplication but just to tell you that there are nine axioms of addition and multiplication and these are those. So you got an associative law, existence, additive inverse, commutative law, associative law for multiplication and so on. So this is just nothing, you can just take a pause and take a note on the axioms of addition and multiplication, what it is all about till the distributive law. And there are certain things which are called axioms of order and there are three, trichotomy, transitivity and monotonicity. Now viewers might disagree, some of the axioms is here and there but that is not my basic objective. My basic objective is to let you know the, what are the axioms of addition, multiplication and order, the order or there might be certain things which are missing, you can just look into it. Okay, so first of all what we come is called axioms of addition. Now when we come to axioms of addition, what I would like to tell you is what is a closure property. Now the very English term closure in terms of mathematics, it is called a subset of a given set. So if a subset of a given set is closed, right, it's closed under an operation of the larger set, if performing on members of the subset always produces a member of that subset. So for example, if I say the positive integers are closed in addition, that means one with an addition and positive integer gives another positive integer, but not under subtraction because one minus two is not a positive integer, even though both one and two are positive integers. So here is a mathematical definition, A and B are real numbers. There is only one number that is A plus B, which is the sum. We further, so let us define this as axiom one. So AX one, because we will be using those axioms in this video to prove certain theorems. So uh, just remember the number is important, axiom one. We come next to what is called a commutative property. Now in general, what do we mean by commute? To change, alter, uh, to give in uh, exchange for another, exchanging or commuting foreign currency, to convert into another form, whatever. So commutative property is all about this. So we know that. So A plus B in exchange you can call, uh, in exchange of another gives B plus A. So let us call it as axiom 2. 
The third which comes is the associative property. So in general association means to connect or to join with something. Here also it is the same. So as you see that A plus B plus C connects with that and let us call this as axiom 3. So we are done with the closure, commutative and associative property. We know the real literary meaning and the mathematical meaning. So now we come to the next part, which is the existence of zero, right? So here is P1. There is only one number zero. Uh, I meant to say there is one and only one number zero called zero, uh, such that A plus zero equals to A for any number A. Next we come, which is called axiom four, and we come to existence of negative. And here it is. If A is any number, there is only and only one number X, such that a plus x equals to 0 and this number is called negative of a and is denoted by minus a. This is called axiom 5. So these are the axioms, right? Then we got something like this. For each a there is a real number such that it is right in front of you. So we take ahead these five, six axioms right now and uh, what we do, this is the axiom 6. We first come to this theorem. So what is this theorem? So we get if A and B are any numbers, just uh, you can read it slowly, then there is only one and one number X such that A plus X equals to B and this number is given by X equal to B plus within bracket minus A. Now what we are going to do over here is that we are going to get a proof of that. So there are two results which will come. One, B plus minus A satisfies the equation A, A, A plus X equal to B and number two, is that no other number satisfies the equation, right? These are the two results that will be the outcome. So let us go ahead with a simple proof. So let us suppose that x equals to this and we here use a plus x equal to a plus x and remember that we are using uh, 2, 3 and 4 axioms, right? So axioms 2, 3 and 4, here we use it. So we go further with this and we get this. And this is being replaced. So you can understand that B plus minus is actually this. So this X gets replaced. We get further this. We cancel out the A's and we get A equal to 0 plus B. Uh, so yeah, so we get this. So the result 1 is in front of you. So this is proven. It's quite a simple proof. We just use the axiom 2, 3 and 4 and here it is that it must satisfy a plus x equal to b and it holds. So you can see it's a plus x equals to b. Right, so, so you can just go back and see what we have done. Simple using those axioms, 0 plus b equals to b, so a plus x equal to b. So we have done that. Now coming to the second part that no number satisfies this equation. What are we going to do is that a plus x equal to b now what I'm going to do is I'm, we are going to use axioms 2, 3 and 4. You can go back if you don't remember what are those axioms all about. So here we do what is that we write, suppose that a plus x equal to b and we, what we do is that we are using minus a on both the sides. Okay, so you using those axioms, what I have done is that I, we have used minus a on both the sides, which leads to this, which leads to this and finally, you see that 0 plus x equals to x. So what we get is this one, right? So we conclude this one x equal to b plus minus a and from here it is unique, right? And the uniqueness of the solution is thus being established. So now just remember one thing that this x equal to b plus minus a, this is now it is proved, right? So just note that, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Just note that here what happens is that once we conclude the uniqueness of the solution, right, it is being established, the number b plus within bracket minus a is denoted by b minus a. I hope that is quite elementary. You don't need to uh, go further. So this is the second number. So it satisfies and there is no number which satisfies this equation. So you see how simply we are using the axioms in order to get hold of the proof. So is unique and thus it is established. Okay, fine. So we go to the next part of the theorem. This is also quite simple. I mean to say, uh, these are not at all, uh, you know, difficult theorems. So let us go ahead and see what is there in theorem two. So we see that if A is a number, then 
uh, minus of minus equals to a. It's quite obvious, right? This is almost like a school level thing. But if a and b are numbers, then this equals to this, obviously, right? But the question is that given those theorem, how we can prove that? So as I told you, if you see, watch my uh, previous lectures in real analysis with this video, that those things which are taken to be very simple, we are going deep into that and proving them, right? So what I do from the definition of negative, right, which you have already seen, we take this and it goes into this. So what happens is that if we further go into this, so this comes actually from the existence of negative, which is the axiom 5. So axiom 5 states that the negative of minus a is unique, right? Therefore, a equals to minus of minus a, right? So this is unique and you see a equals to minus of minus a and thus we prove this. Very simple. Just from the negative uh, axiom, uh, axiom of existence of negative, we get this one. So this is proven and this is A equals to minus of minus A right now. So this theorem is proved. Now we go to the second part of the theorem, which is minus A plus B, this one, right? So we use those axioms and then we get into this existence of negative, right? Further, we get into this and we get this and we get this. So now you see, this is important that using these axioms, when we went to zero, the result is zero. The result follows from the only one part of axiom five. So the existence of negative is this one, but right at the bottom of your screens, you see if any is any number, there is only one number X and that is what we have proved it. The value uh, comes to zero, right? Yeah, I have highlighted this one. So this is only one number, right? Okay. Now, one thing is also important, the manipulative properties of opening up A plus B whole squared, etc. And if I multiply this to 6AC, etc. These are also coming from axioms 2, 3 and 4, right? And further this, if B comma D not equals to 0, these are coming from axiom 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So, we assume you are familiar with those properties. So, just you can now deduce yourself that in order to take those properties, we can do the manipulative part, how these real numbers come through. Okay, so we come to another important uh, concept. What is an order relation? Now, I would just like to take a pause and tell you now, see, an order relation is basically a relation that ranks elements against one another, right? This is big, this is small. So it provides a kind of a formal framework for describing statements, which is say, for example, this is less than that, or this precedes that. So this is where we are going to provide a basic definition and understanding of an order relation. Okay. So what we can say that the real numbers possess an order relation, obviously, <laughs> and this relation is based on this symbol, which is greater than, and the axioms of order in terms of R is based on this. So if A and B is a member of R, then this is true. If A, B and C are member of R, real number, this is true. And this is called the transitive property. There are other reflexive and other properties which I have not mentioned. And if this is true, then this is holds. And if this is true, this holds. So what, what you see in view of the axioms above the field of real numbers R is said to be ordered, right? So using, and now we can use this less than sign further to go. So in view of this above axioms, the field of real numbers R is said to be ordered. Okay, yeah. So if we take this less than, we can use this one. A greater than B, this one, B less than A. So you can just, this is in terms of, uh, you know, defining again the ordered relation in the less than sign. So, yeah, so this is, this is what, so greater than now it is used, can be expressed in terms of relation. So what I say that R is said to be ordered and R is also said to be an ordered field. So we can take rational numbers Q also, but I've not taken it. So this is what I'm trying to tell you that, that ordered and ordered field, we are formally defining R to be ordered and R is ordered field. So this is quite simple. When we write A greater than equals to B, we mean A greater than B or A equals to B. And if I write A less than equals to B, it would be similar. So you might be wondering why we are telling this because now you see we are formalizing those definitions 
we are formalizing our understanding. So it's some simple, if I take the positive real numbers and negative real numbers, I can use the set theory definition of union, I can write it. Positive and negative rational numbers are also denoted by this. This is just to explain, just to give you an idea how we are proceeding. Now, using the same convention, what we can do is that we can denote A greater than B is greater than C, right? And uh, that's it. So, we were using the usual convention of A greater than B and B greater than C. So, we shall simply write A greater than B is equal to C. Now, here is something important. Now, if I write A greater than B equal greater than C, we shall simply write and say that B lies between A and C. We can tell that, right? So, B lies between A and C. And if X, say for example, is a member of positive integer and Y is a member of negative integer, then what we can say is that X is greater than 0 and obviously Y is less than 0. That is, 0 is greater than Y in other way. Yeah. So, hence uh, what it implies that X is less than 0 and Y is less than 0 implies, okay, yeah, yeah, it comes. So, I think this part is okay. Uh, if I want to repeat it, so x greater than 0 and y greater than 0 implies that 0 lies between two real numbers, right? So, the b, sorry, b lies between two, uh, between a and c. And if x has a member and z, x is greater than 0 and y is less than 0, that means 0 is greater than y. So, going to the next part, what I can tell you, uh, this is also implies. So, if x is less than 0 and less than y, what it does implies is this. Here, it implies that 0 lies between, so here is 0 and these are the two real numbers. So, 0 lies between every two real numbers of opposite signs and every positive number is greater than every negative number. So, you can take a pause. I think I'm not going too fast. Uh, these are the things which comes. So, from the earlier part it comes and then here uh, considering, so the earlier one went with what you called greater than part. We got B lying between and it with the leg, negative, uh, with the less than part, we got this one, right? So, this is how uh, things go ahead and let us see some examples. So, yeah, we can call this one, right? And then we can call this one and then we call, uh, yeah. So, that, that that is basically the example. I mean to say, it, it gives you a basic understanding of using those. Now, coming to the last part of the video, which I called it as using logical quantifiers. Now, why I am using logical quantifiers? Because uh, for the students specifically, you will see in real analysis, there are a lot of logical symbols of set theory and logic which is being used, which might come as a surprise because you are not used to this. So, what I will do is that I will use these logical quantifiers and I will use the same concept of those theorems what we have seen in a different way. Before we go ahead, here is a quick recap. So, you see this opposite E sign followed by a exclamation. It, uh, it is uniqueness quantification. That means there exists exactly one. So, you see here. So, what do I mean? It means there exists exactly one small n which is a member of the real number or the, uh, so say, uh, sorry, the natural number n Various n plus 5 gives equal to 2n, right? And here is that sign. This is the set membership is a member. So, I can use the further examples. X is a member of A, right? So, why I am telling you? Because I will be using those in the later part of the video to show you. Okay. This one, the opposite A is called universal quantifier. That means for all, for everything, right? So, here it says sir, for all values if small n is in the set of natural numbers begin. Then we use this one, the opposite E, which is called existential quantifier, which means there exists, I have just given a simple ex example, there exists a horse. And then we see this one, which is called a logically implies. So, if it is raining, then it is pouring. So, I can write, it is raining, it implies that it is pouring. Just a kind of a basic example. So, now we can define the closure property which we have defined with set R just like this, right? So, for all A and B, a set of R, it implies A plus B, right? Then we can use the same for associative property, operation of addition, we can use for all A, B and C. It's simple. So, we are just using this opposite A. 
uh, in case yeah commutative law is done in the same way you see for all a b and c a and b and then we can use the existence of zero in the same way right so for only and only right there is only one e uh, zero which exists in a and we can get a plus zero equals to a we can use the existing of inverse elements also you see we have uh, deducted that so for all a which is a member of real number r there exist only minus a r and so on so that uh, only one universal only universal all these operators and then we come to the distributive law where we can also use all the a plus a b c is equals to this so this is not the addition obviously distributive law is that of multiplication so this is just to explain you that how these logical quantifiers comes into the mathematics so that it doesn't come as a surprise for you so that's it we are done so what we have learned let us uh, quickly review field and field axiom we have also learned why do we need axioms uh, axioms of addition and what are the proofs for those two theorems we have also learned what is ordered relation and so on now you can be a part of our team you can send your scientific articles essays research papers lesson plans on a particular subject of science for further details please write to us at editor@physicsforstudents.com stay safe and happy So don't forget to like subscribe and click on the bell icon to get all the notifications this is Shonak signing off from physics for students and let me know your comments in the comment section and and I will continue bringing more videos and real analysis bye and do take care